embark on a journey of inspiration and discovery with the Purdue Lecture Hall Series, proudly presented by the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. Join us as we delve into the remarkable odysseys of these aspiring scientists, each crafting their own narrative in the world of science and groundbreaking research. Take a glimpse into their diverse cultural backgrounds and the journeys that brought them to Purdue University. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Welcome everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Director of Scientific Strategy and Relations of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And today on our Purdue Lecture Hall series, I have the pleasure of welcoming Valin Dile, who is a dedicated PhD candidate in the Department of Medicinal Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology here at Purdue University. Valindile Moza is working with Professor uh, Rob Stalin, and she earned her BS in uh, biochemistry and molecular bi biology and biotechnology from Michigan State University in 2019. With a passion for scientific exploration, Valindile chose to pursue her doctoral research in the esteemed Stalin Lab at Purdue University. Her primary research area centers around unraveling the intricate mechanisms employed by the Ebola virus matrix protein VP40 during the assembly and budding stages of the virus. During her doctoral journey, Balindili has developed a keen interest in leveraging various cutting-edge biophysical techniques. These techniques include surface plasmon resonance, SPR, isother isothermal titration calorimetry, ITC, and microscopy. These tools empower her to delve into viral processes at a molecular level, providing invaluable insights into virus-host interactions. In addition to her research endeavors, Bali actively contributes to the academic community. She currently holds the role of a teaching assistant at the pharmacy live cell imaging facility. In this capacity, she imparts her expertise to train users in the intricacies of microscopy, further enriching the scientific ecosystem. Valindili's academic journey showcases her commitment to advancing our understanding of biobiology and her dedication to fostering knowledge sharing among peers and aspiring scientists. Thank you so much for being on the program, Bali. It's so good to have you on. And I am so excited to hear about your work. And because we've been, we've hosted a few other students from the Stalin Lab. So yeah. we're starting to really understand this VP40 <laughs> protein. And you guys have been characterizing this protein and the Ebola virus, Marburg virus is uh, such a fascinating area of research. And thank you. Thank you for sharing with us today. Well, thank you very much for having me and thank you for such a kind introduction. And I'm really excited to share my scientific journey and a little bit about the work that I do here at Purdue today. Well, we're excited to hear it. As usual, please go ahead, share your slides. I'm going to let you take the spotlight and turn myself off, put myself on mute and enjoy <laughs> while you present. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Let's make sure I'm sharing the right ones. Yes, perfect. Okay, so like I said, today I'm going to be talking a little bit mostly about my scientific journey, how I got into science, and then sharing a little bit of the work that I do and how we study how these mutations that occur in the Ebola virus matrix protein could affect, affect the viral life cycle. So I'm gonna jump in a little bit into my background. So I was born in the tiny kingdom of Eswatini. Um, so if you look at the map, I'm gonna pull out my laser pointer. If you look at the map of Africa, Eswatini is located, it's a very small kingdom nested between South Africa and Mozambique. Um, 
right there. Most people like to think of us as part of South Africa. We're not part of South Africa. We're a different country. Previously, Eswatini was known as the Kingdom of Swaziland, and I believe in 2018 is when the name was officially changed to the Kingdom of Eswatini. Like I said, it's a small country with only about 1.2 million people. Um, the kingdom is now known to be the last, or well, Africa's last absolute monarchy. And what that means is that the king and the queen, so this is the king, we call him Ingwenyama or the lion, and the queen mother, also known as Ndlovugazi, the she elephant, they have absolute power in ruling the kingdom. So that's why we're known as Africa's last absolute monarchy. Um, Swaziland is known, or well, I keep saying Swaziland because it was Swaziland when I left the country, it was still Swaziland. So for me, it's not, I'm not used to saying Eswatini. So whenever I say Swaziland, I'm referring to Eswatini. Um, but Eswatini is known for its culture and heritage that is still a big part of the lives of the Swati people. We have a lot of traditional holidays or cultural festivals that occur throughout the year. And in here, I'm just highlighting a few of those festivals. And what we have here on this left corner is the Umhlanga Reed Dance. And this is a festival that brings together from all corners of the country, young girls and young women, and they come to cut the reed. So what they're carrying here is reed that is gonna be used to do maintenance on the windbreakers of the Queen's village. So this tradition is really to foster kind of like paying homage to the Queen. And also it's a time where they foster values of abstinence and chastity in young women before marriage. Today, this festival is also evolved into teaching young women about how sexually transmitted infections can affect their lives, but most importantly, but uh, it's been used to teach about HIV prevention. Um, the way this festival works is it's a five day festival where the girls go and cut the reed and there's a lot of learning that happens. But on the last day, which is pictures right here, it's a day of celebration and dance. So this is a day when the whole country and tourists can come and see the girls showcase their dances. And we also have a chance to see the princesses as pictured right here, showcasing their dance skills as well. It's just a joyous celebration to show basically celebrate the young women in the country. And then at the top right here is the Buganu Marula Festival. This festival is, as the name says, it celebrates this marula fruit that is pictured right here. So throughout the year, when this fruit is kind of, when the tree is bearing fruit, young um, women and children will collect the fruit and keep it until it ripens. And once it ripens, it's going to be fermented with sugar and water to make this potent alcoholic drink. So once this drink has been made, we have festivals in two parts of the country where the women in the country will brew this um, marula beer, bring it to the festival, and the king and the queen are invited to sample this beer. And once the king and the king, king and the queen have sampled the beer, it indicates that now the nation can enjoy. So that's kind of like our way of being like now the festival is opened and the nation can enjoy this marula beer and different marula delicacies. Today, it's also been used as a way of promoting women-run businesses and also promoting nonprofit endeavors that have been started by the Queen Mother and some of the Queens. The one that's pictured at the bottom, the Ingwala Harvest Festival. This one is also known as the First Fruit Festival. When I was growing up, I was told that it's the national prayer. This is a time when Swazis we um celebrate the first harvest, but it's also a time that indicates a renewal. And it's also a sense of Swazi pride and culture. This is a time basically you think about it as a prayer to us, um, our ancestors and a cleansing and basically getting kind of deeper into your culture at this moment. It is actually suggested that a man should attend this festival once in their year. It's a little bit more complex in that there's a lot of cultural traditions that occur at this event that are not allowed to be videotaped. We're told when we're growing up, there's songs that are sang during this festival that you're not allowed to sing anywhere else, um, that kind of stuff. But um, this is all to say that Swaziland, despite all of the modernization, is still one of the most cultural um, and traditional countries that we have. We really enjoy our traditional festivals. And even though Swaziland is a small country, one of the smallest landlocked countries in Southern Africa, it makes up for its size in a lot of different ways. And we have different parts or uh, things that tourists can come and partake in. So if you ever find yourself in Southern Africa, I say take a shot left into a Swedish and come and see 
what we have to offer. So what I have here, we have a cultural village. It's called the Mandenga Cultural Village. This is a place where different tourists and even Swazis can come really to learn about the Swazi culture. Here you get immersed in understanding different Swazi cultural practices. You get to partake in Swazi dance. You get to eat Swazi food. And pictured right here are actually Swazi huts. We call them Bokuka Standaze because you have to kneel to get into the door. So at this cultural village, you actually get to understand a lot about Swazi culture. And we also have beautiful landscape in Eswatini. Um, we have lots of forests, rivers, mountains. It's a high veld area. There's actually a point in the country that is my favorite part where when you stand on it, you can see all four corners of the country. And I think it's just absolutely amazing. And throughout the country, we have different nature reserves that house the big five. So if you are an animal lover, Swaziland is definitely the place to come and see all these different um, animals that we have. So now moving on to like my early education, um, starting back in high school. So I attended high school at St. Mark's High School. This is a public high school in the capital city in Babane. Um, the way Swaziland is so small, most of my family actually attended this high school. So it's kind of like a place where most, uh, most of my family, most of my friends that I went to primary school with, we all went to the same school just because there aren't a lot of schools in Swaziland and the population is small. But when I was in high school, I was not interested in sciences. And this is not because I did not enjoy science subjects. I enjoyed the science subjects, but the examples of science or the careers that I thought were available for me to get to go to are very limited in Swaziland. Um, so in my mind, if you studied sciences, you could either be a teacher, teaching science, teaching chemistry, you could be a doctor, you could be a nurse, or you could be like some sort of pharmacist. And to me, the scariest part about those was just having to engage with people. I was more introverted at the time and I really didn't want to be engaging with people. So when I was in high school, I focused more on studying economics and business as a career path. And I was actually very keen in it. This is an article that I wrote at the time when the Swazi government was building an airport. And I was using my economic expertise to try and explain how this is not a good economic decision. Um, and that we should use the money more to actually build schools. I don't think anyone read it, but it was a sense of pride at the time and me using my economic hat. And for me, a lot changed when I got the chance to attend the African Leadership Academy. And the African Leadership Academy is a high school or a two-year program that is located in the outskirts of Johannesburg. And the aim of this academy is the aim to transform Africa by developing the next generation of African leaders. So in my last year in high school, I actually dropped out to go and attend the African Leadership Academy. And here they have this diverse curriculum that focuses on entrepreneurial leadership, African studies, writing and rhetoric, and then we get to do A-level courses. And at that time, I still had a focus in business because I still took business studies and economics, but I also took biology and chemistry. And what really shifted for me was having different people from different um people with different careers come into the school and talk to us about what they do. And this allowed me to understand that being in science is broader than just being a doctor and a nurse, that there's different types of scientific roles that can be played. And I really like the idea of being able to participate in kind of healthcare, but in the backgrounds, because that's how I understand research is we're still kind of in that spectrum of healthcare. We're still kind of like in this trying to fight diseases, but we're more in the background. And for me, that um, sparked the scientific curiosity so that when I graduated um, African Leadership Academy, I sought out programs that were going to allow me to do research. Initially, I wanted to go to a university in Africa called Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technologies, one of the the best science universities. Um, but in the end, when I was graduation, graduating, I actually got a chance to attend Michigan State University. So I applied to a lot of different schools, NAST being my top school. But when I got offered this chance to apply to Michigan State University, I just could not pass it up because I think in my head, I had not thought that I could have a chance to go and study abroad in America. So that's why I was looking mainly at the schools that were in Africa. But um, here I also got a MasterCard Foundation scholarship. 
And this scholarship is where the MasterCard Foundation and Michigan State have this partnership where they actually give full funded scholarship to students in, from underprivileged communities in Africa for them to come and pursue their bachelor's and master's degrees in different Michigan State and other universities had this partnership with MasterCard Foundation. And when I came here, I studied biochemistry and molecular biology and biotechnology. And so pictured here is the Spartan statue, probably my favorite place at Michigan State University. It's always fun to see how during games it's being decorated. We had, I found this very weird tradition that people would actually go and guard the statue, especially if we had games against the rival school, um, University of Michigan. And Michigan State was a lot of firsts for me. As you can see, first time in snow, it was not fun having to be in snow for the first time. I remember dreading it every time, but as time got by, you kind of get used to it. And I actually love snow now. I think it's quite beautiful. It's still cold, but it's probably one of the most beautiful things that you can see. But it was also the first time I got to understand college football. I do not have college football in Swaziland to understand how the love for college football in America and actually get ingrained into that culture. And I always tell people, I'm like, you know, my team is my alma mater. I'm always going to be a Spartan when it comes to football. And it was also the time when I started getting into research and practicing research. Um, my first research experience was during my first summer um, in Michigan State. And at this time I had a chance to go to the Kellogg Biological Station on an undergraduate research apprentice program. And this program is where students from MSU can come to the Kellogg Biological Station and do like research under different labs. I got assigned to the Jen Lau's lab and I worked with a PhD student at the time. She has since graduated, Susan Magnoli. And the project that we're looking at was focused on how we can optimize the restoration of prairies to kind of combat the effects of climate change on these prairies. We looked at how different plant compositions, so these are the different compositions of plants that we have. We looked at population, how plant population can affect how these prairies thrive. And also we looked at how we can actually add pollination. So we'd actually go out and add pollen into these plants to see if that can help the prairies um, thrive as well. So my days there basically look like this. We'd be out in the field with our tape, sometimes with our water guns and fertilizers to go and water plants. We'd go and actually collect stigmas to count pollen. But it was really, really, really exciting because we're able to get to some kind of um, answers is what I'd like to say, how we're able to understand how when you increase the density of plants in a certain area, for example, this decreases the amount of pollen that is able to get to those plants because there's competition. So having more plants is not necessarily a good thing. And also able to understand that adding pollen will actually cause the plants to drive more, but there's also that offset of increasing the density of plants. And for me, this was the first time that I'd gotten into research and I liked the idea of research. I enjoyed the research, but I knew that I did not enjoy it much being in the sun and like the day to day of having to go to the sun and pollen, pollinate the plants by hand and doing all of that. So when I got back to Michigan State, I reached out to different professors. I think I sent out 10 emails to professors, not necessarily in a particular field. At this point, I just wanted to gain more research experience. I sent out to different professors. Of the five, maybe four that replied to my email, I got an acceptance from Dr. Bjorn Hamburger's lab. And this is really where I spent most of my time in Michigan State. I was in the lab for three years. And when I joined the lab, um, it was mostly as like a technical assistant. So I was helping with the maintenance of the lab. I was helping with cleaning of glassware, um, taking care of waste, making sure supplies are stocked and all of that kind of stuff. But I also got to partake in a very, very cool project that we called Mission Immossible. And this project was looking at how we can use mosses as bioreactors to produce high value compounds. And it, it entailed first having to be able to propagate and sustain these mosses on media plates. So we develop, developed a sterile technique. The lab developed the sterile technique of how we can actually propagate these mosses into plates. And over time, you can monitor the growth of the mosses. And after two weeks is when we'll propagate them again to kind of keep the line growing. And in doing this, we had different, I think 16 different transgenic lines of moss. And once this um, kind of technique, Propagation was um, um, 
established, we also did some transformations of different genes into this MOS genome. And the idea here is that if you transform this gene into the MOS genome, the genome is going to be able to uptake that gene and produce whatever compound is in there. And we're going to reuse genes that contain some compounds like terpenoids, like important compounds that have been implicated in mal malaria therapeutics, and also as a proof of concept, uh, fluorescent tag, like an EYFP. And this is something that cool that came out of this project is once it actually transformed this mosses, you're able to see right here the positive um, plates that have been transformed that carry kind of that UIFP or GFP gene if you put them under UV light. And this was kind of revolutionary because now you can go and actually pick just the positive ones and propagate them to kind of keep that kind of transgenic or transformed moss going. So this was a really cool thing to think about how we can make science more green instead of using all of the chemicals to make, um, or make using reactors and using kind of plants to make these compounds, how we can use nature to help us make these compounds because it has the ability to do this in its genome. And at the Hamburger Lab, I also had a chance to partake in different outreach projects. And this was probably my favorite one. It was called the Fascination of Plants Day at MSU. And this was a day when students, I mean, young children and their families, families would come to see different cool projects that we had around plants. And the nice thing about this is it wasn't like more advanced science, but it was simple things like having a smelling station and the children would um, actually enjoy guessing the different smells that we had. We'd make small microscopes out of paper for them to be able to view things, have cool plants that are sensitive to touch. And I think this really resonated with me because in my head, I was like, well, if I had something like this when I was growing up in Swaziland, I would have loved science too. And I hope that this is something that many communities in the future can incorporate because I think it's such a nice way of introducing young children to science and making it cool. Um, I liked it so much such that now when I'm going back home, I'm buying all of the science games for my cousins and my nieces for them to be able to play with because I just think this is a nice way to kind of open up the world of science to young children. And um, while I was at Michigan State, I also had a chance to do a summer internship back home in Eswatini. So I really wanted to kind of understand the landscape of research back home. Because like I said before, I had never really learned about research in Eswatini. So I got a chance to do an internship at the National Tuberculosis Control Program. And I was part of a survey team called the Drug Resistant Survey Team. And the aim of this team is doing a survey in the country about how we can improve diagnostic testing for multi-drug resistant TB. And this was a way of if we can diagnose it quicker, then we can be able to um, treat patients that are infected with this multi-drug resistant TB a lot quicker. And that time look, they looked, um, so many different things that I was involved in. First, it was outreach. So here I was going into these different centers and helping teach healthcare workers on the importance of good samples, because we all knew that good diagnostics will start with having a good sample. So we had to go out across the country and help inform um, healthcare workers on how they can help patients produce good samples, how the samples can be stored and transported so that by the time they get to the labs, they're still viable for testing. I also got a chance to participate in what we called peripheral laboratories. These were laboratories where all of the possible cases of TB came in and we had a small gene expert machine that did like two hour testing to kind of give you a yes or no answer. And then from that point, I also had a chance to now go to the national lab. This is where we do the characterization for multi-drug resistant um, TB. And this helps us kind of tailor the type of, tailor the medication that a patient could take. And a big part of this was really understanding how well this step at the peripheral laboratory was diagnosing TB and how we can fine tune that kind of area to make sure that we're getting TB cases, false positive and false negatives to kind of understand those trends. And that was the role of this survey team. So um, when I graduated Michigan State, I knew that I wanted to pursue a PhD. I had had experience with many different PhD students in the lab and um, what I also wanted to study further was disease uh, pathology, because a lot of the research that I'd done had not really been focused on certain diseases. So this is what I kind of sought of, sort of after were programs that were going to help me understand certain diseases better. So I sought out Purdue University and the Department of Molecular Pharmacology because 
molecular pharmacology and medicinal chemistry because at the time I wasn't sure of the spectrum of drug discovery that I wanted to cover. I had not really done anything with diseases, but and I didn't know where in that spectrum. And this department offered different labs that are all within that spectrum. But I knew that I wanted to study diseases that have, have affected African communities. So when I went into the program, that's all I had. I was like, I just want to be able to understand infectious diseases that have affected African communities. I wanna understand how they work and I wanna be part of that problem to be an agent of positive change in this space and in Africa. So for that, the Stalin lab was a natural fit for me because um, it had uh, projects understanding viral assembly and budding and there I was able to work on the Ebola virus. So now I'm going to transition into my work with the Ebola virus that I've been doing for the past couple of years and the techniques that we use and trying to basically explain to you what it looks like to study this virus in our setting. So a little bit of background on the Ebola virus. The Ebola virus is an envelope virus, so it has a membrane and it belongs to the phyloviridae family. And what that means is just this, this filamentous shaped family of viruses. Um, its close cousin that you've probably heard of is the Marburg virus. And there's six identified different species or strains of the Ebola virus, four of which um, infect, um, actually four of which cause disease in humans. And the Zaire strain is known to be the most dangerous, but altogether the Ebola virus has a varying fatality rate ranging from 25% to 90%. And um, the Ebola virus first appeared in the 1970s. And this whole, one of its hallmark symptoms is causing this fatal hemorrhagic fever. It was identified, I think, something like 20 kilometers close to the Ebola River, and that's where it gets its name. And we are not sure exactly, but we suspect that the fruit bat pictured here is its natural host, and that the fruit bat transmits this virus to an wild animals in the, um, to different animals in the wild, like monkeys and gorillas, probably through bites, and that when humans interact with these animals and they're scratched, then they get to um, contract the Ebola virus. And that there's human to human transmission through blood secretion and other bodily fluids. And because of this mode of transmission in humans, the people that are most at risk of contracting Ebola virus are healthcare workers when they're taking care of patients, people who test samples for Ebola virus, so the scientists and family members when they're caring for deceased. The largest outbreak that we had was in 2013 to 2016. And here we had over 28,000 cases and over 11,000 deaths, which is about a 40% fatality rate. And unfortunately, even though we have this long history, outbreaks are still recurrent. And this is because this virus is still present um, in the wild in this animal reservoirs. And when humans interact with these reservoirs, then there's an outbreak. Um, these outbreaks are mostly recurrent in parts of West Africa that is pictured right here. And as you can see with the red, the Zaire strain, which is the most dangerous, is also the most prevalent strain that we have. So even though we've had all of these outbreaks, um, we still have limited therapeutics that target Ebola virus. So we have two monoclonal antibody treatments, and these ones are antibodies that will bind to the Glycoprotein, so the glycoprotein is the one that will attach to the entry receptor. So these antibodies will stop entry, or will they inhibit entry of the virus into the cell. And if they're taken early enough, then they're effective in reducing the illness in a patient. And we also have one approved vaccine that is used to prevent um, Ebola virus, and it's given to healthcare workers when they go to um, respond to outbreaks in places that have been affected by the virus. But all of these are only effective against the Zaire strain, so we do not have any therapeutics that targets all these other strains. So we need to really understand in further detail this Ebola virus life cycle so that we can tease out or identify new therapeutic targets other than just targeting viral entry. So what do we know about the Ebola virus life cycle so far? So we know that um, during an infection, the Ebola variants in here is going to attach to the host cell. And this attachment leads to the engulfment of the virion into the cell called micropenocytosis. And when this virion is engulfed, it goes into the early endosome. And in the early endosome, there's an important step that is called membrane fusion. So this is where the viral membrane 
It fuses with the endosomal membrane and this fusion leads to the release of this genetic material or ribonucleic acid, ribonucleocapsid into the cytoplasm. And when this is released, we go different stages of viral transcription and viral protein translation to make these different viral proteins. When these viral proteins are made, they're traffic to the plasma membrane where they assembly to form this new budding variant that will go ahead and do the cycle all over again and infect a new cell. So my project is focused on one of those viral proteins, the matrix protein VP40. So this matrix protein actually lines the variant. And what we're looking at here is a cross-section area. So if you were to take the virus and like cut it, into like that in house, we're looking at cross-section area of the virion. And the matrix protein is the blue that lines kind of like the virion attached to the membrane. That's why we call it a matrix protein. And the matrix protein is known in its role mainly in assembly and budding. So what happens in the cell is that the VP40 matrix protein is trafficked to the plasma membrane. When it goes to the plasma membrane, it binds to this membrane, interacting with membrane lipids. And then this interaction leads to the formation of this oligomeric hexameric form, leading to the recruitment of more VP40 to the membrane, such that you have this long matrix along the membrane that will form kind of like the shell that will line the virus for packaging, what I call the guts of the virus. But during this step where it binds, there's also different stages of membrane rearrangement, um, rearranging of membrane lipids that causes this membrane curvature. And that's how we end up having this filamentous virion that has this shell on it. So my project is focusing on how we use cellular and biophysical studies to understand mutations that occur in this matrix protein and understand how they affect the viral life cycle. So before I go into the work that I do, we know we normally rank pathogens in this uh, scale, biosafety level scale. And this biosafety level scale has, helps us understand the safety or protective measures that we need to take so that we can work with certain pathogens safely. And it brings pathogens from low risk to high risk. And the Ebola virus is actually a BSL-4 pathogen, which is the highest risk pathogen that we have, highest risk category. And here, these are diseases that will cause lethal disease um, in humans and also we do not have a lot of therapeutic intervention for them. So like we know we don't have a lot of therapeutics for the Ebola virus. So I'm gonna be talking about how we are able to use different tools to study not really the live virus, but different aspects of the virus in a BSL-2 setting and how we translate that into understanding the viral life cycle. So why do we even care about mutations in the first place? So virus has a sequence, so what we call the viral genome. And every time the sequence is like a set of base pairs, or you can think about them as a set of letters like we have here. And these, they're specific to pro certain proteins, specific to certain viruses. And every time that this virus replicates and spreads, it will copy this sequence over and over again. And sometimes during the copying of the sequence, there is like a mess up, a slip in the wheel somewhere where there is a change in in this sequence. So here we have a change from a G to a U. And this variation in the sequence can have different implications on the virus itself. Often at times and most times when you have this alteration in the sequence, it does not have an effect on the way that the virus functions and it does not alter the virus in any way. Sometimes you have combinations that are not favorable to the virus. So this looks, leads to a weaker virus and these strains tend to die off over time. But often at times we have favorable um, combinations that cause the virus to thrive and make it much more stronger. And if you don't believe me, we have seen this happen a lot in the COVID-19 pandemic where we had a lot of mutations that led to strains that were able to thrive, leading for it to be a much longer pandemic than we thought. So in my work with the Ebola virus, I'm going to be looking at four mutations today. And my mutation of interest really was this G198R mutation. And this mutation was isolated in patients in the 2013 to 2016 outbreak. And if you look at the structure, this is a structure of VP40. And this is where it would bind the membrane. This is where this position is located, this G198 here. 
but we also made some other mutations. So we wanted to see if you mutated. So this mutate, you want to add eyes a mutation from a glycine to an arginine, but we wanted to see what if you mutated to a different amino acid. So what if you mutated to an alanine? and aspartic acid, but also what if you mutate a different position? How does this affect the viral life cycle? And this helps us understand if this residue itself is important, if this um, position is important, or if the mutation just randomly happened and does not have any effect on the viral life cycle. So the first thing that we wanted to look at is we wanted to study how these mutations affect VP40 cellular localization using confocal microscopy. And confocal microscopy is a form of microscopy that allows us to take sharp images of cells that would otherwise be blurry if we're using a bright filled microscope. And it's able to do this because it has a feature that blocks out of focus light from the sample so that we're able to take higher resolution images. And in confocal microscopy, we're also able to label different organelles with stainings and immunofluorescence so that we can able to identify and take higher resolution images of these organelles. And in our experiment, we have our VP40 protein in a plasmid with a GFP tag. So this is a green fluorescent protein tag for labeling our protein, and it's transfected into cells. Once the plasmid enters the cells, it's going the protein will be expressed, and it's going to localize to the organelle that it prefers or the organelle where it localizes during the viral life cycle. During this point, we have stains. So we have a nuclear stain to stain the nucleus and a plasma membrane stain to stain the plasma membrane. We go through confocal microscopy and now we're able to see the subcellular localization of our VP40 protein. So we see here in green, the GFP tag is our VP40 protein. We're able to see that it looks like it goes mostly to the membrane. We see our nucleus stain and then our plasma membrane stain. These stains also allow us to be able first to see where it goes. So in the overlap, we know it goes to the plasma membrane, but also we can use them to quantify now the amount of protein that we have in the plasma membrane, as opposed to the amount of protein that we have to the rest of the cell. And with our mutations, what we found is that, so this is what I've been showing you, is our wild type, so no mutation. Um, and what we have is most of the VP40, as you can see, is at the plasma membrane. And we still to see these protrusions like spikes that is phenotypic of VP40. And most of the mutations that I have, so this G198A mutation has a similar kind of localization and distribution of VP40 compared to the wild type. G198R, which was the one that was isolated in patients, also has a VP40 at the plasma membrane. But now if you start to see the distribution of VP40, we don't have as much in the inside of the cell. Similarly with G201R, most of it is at the plasma membrane. We don't have a lot in kind of like the cytoplasm of the cell. G198D, on the other hand, seems like we don't have a lot of VP40 at the plasma membrane, a lot of it is cytoplasmic, and also we now don't have these protrusions that we see with the other mutants. This was just a control of a protein that we know does not go to the plasma membrane, so we know what zero plasma membrane localization looks like. And when we quantify these images, we're able to see that G198D will significantly decrease the localization of VP40 at the plasma membrane, while our mutation of interest G198R will increase the localization of VP40 at the plasma membrane. So now we kind of go through a different steps on understanding how this happens and possibly why this is happening. So the next thing that I wanted to see is, okay, if it's increasing the assembly at the plasma membrane, how does this affect the budding efficiency of that virion to go and infect new cells? And since the Ebola virus is a BSL-4 pathogen, we don't use the live virus, we actually use a viral-like particle. And a viral-like particle or VLP is a molecule that resembles the virus. We say it mimics the virus in that it has some of the viral proteins, but it does not carry the viral genome, so it's not able to replicate. This allows us to study different stages of the viral life cycle, so we can study viral, we can study entry, assembly, and budding, um, but we cannot study replication because we do not have the viral genome. And we know from our studies that if you actually just transfect VP40 alone in cells, you see these spikes and produce, protrusions that I was talking about, and these spikes and protrusions out of the cell are actually viral-like particles that are budding out into the extracellular space. We've seen through um, electron microscopy that when you look at these um, viral-like particles, they resemble the authentic virus that is seen right here. So this allows us with just this one protein to study viral assembly and budding. And if we add a different protein, the glycoprotein, so this is the receptor in 
seen right here, we can also study viral entry with just these two proteins. So we go ahead and transfect our VP40 in cells, and we collect these viral-like particles, and using a technique called Western blot analysis, we're able to actually quantify how much viral-like particles are budding out of these infected cells and compare how these mutations are affecting budding. And what we're able to see here is that these mutations, G1 and AD, these mutations have a similar effect to the localization that we're looking at in the previous slide, where G1 and AD will decrease the amount of budding, while both G1 and R and G2O1R will increase the amount of budding. G1 and A has no effect in either assembly on budding. Now we wanted to understand, well, why is this happening? How are these mutations affecting assembly and budding? And we looked at molecular dynamic simulations. So molecular dynamic simulations, um, nice way to think about them, these are virtual experiments. These are computer simulation methods that are for analyzing how physical atoms are moving in a space. A nice way to think about them, they help us bridge the gap between theory and experiment. So if you have a hypothesis, you can run it through a simulation and that will help you narrow down your experimental um, like assays and stuff like that. You understand how relevant or physiological system that you're using, but they are not to be uh, confused with actual experiments. We still need to go and verify some of these findings in experimental work, but they help, they help us in refining structures like protein structures. They help us examine things at an atomic level that we'd not be able to see in like a cellular level or to able to see with our experiments. And they also understand how different macromolecules move within a cell, as you can see with this MD simulation, seeing how these three proteins are able to move within this space. In our work, we wanted to use molecular dynamic simulations to understand how these mutations affect how VP40 interacts with the membrane. So we worked with our collaborators in the Shepigan lab at Florida International University. And what they were able to do is use a simulation to see if you have this mutation the G1N8R mutation that occurred in nature, how does that affect how VP40 binds to the membrane? And what we see is in the top, we have our wild type panel, and this is our mutant panel. And if you see the cluster of lipids here is, we're able to find that G1N8R actually changes the way that VP40 interacts with the membrane. When you have this arginine hit this position, you increase, um, the interaction, uh, enhance the interaction of VP40 with the membrane as compared to wild type. And we're also able to see this in measuring the hydrogen bonds between different lipid head groups and the protein. And we're able to show with G1NR, we have this increase in hydrogen bonds. And we wanted to kind of study this in the cell setting, but before I go to that, I want to kind of go into the cell membrane and see what it is now made of. So um, the main role of the cell membrane, it, it separates the extracellular space um, from the intracellular space. And it also like uh, mediates transport of things in and out of the cell. The cell membrane is made out of different macromolecules. It's made out of proteins, but it's mostly made out of phospholipids. And this is a structure of a phospholipid down here where it carries a hydrophilic or a water loving head and a hydrophilic or water hating tail. And what that does is it creates this lipid bilayer where the tails will come together and then the heads will be outside in the more hydrophilic space. So this is what we call it's made out of two phospholipid, two phospholipid layers that we call the phospholipid bilayer. There's a lot of diversity in the lipids that make up the membrane. This is all the lipids that have been shown down here. And we can see, um, including the di different diver the diversity of lipids that make up the membrane, there's also a difference in the two leaflets that we have in the membrane. Some, um, lip some of the phospholipids will be on the outer leaflet, some of them will be on the inner leaflet, and this creates kind of like an electric charge or a charge difference in the two leaflets. And most of the lipids that make up the inner leaflet carry a negative charge. So these are uh, lipids like phosphatidylserine and phosphatidylinositols, and these ones carry mostly a negatively charged head group. So this makes the inner leaflet of the membrane more negative than the outer leaflet of the membrane. So when we look at our protein of interest, VP40, we've seen through research that it will actually preferentially bind to one it will actually preferentially bind to phosphatidylserine in the membrane. So phosphatidylserine in our schematic is seen in blue, which is in the inner leaflet of the membrane mostly. And this binding of, of phosphatidylserine will lead 
to the recruitment of more VP40, but also what happens is when it binds, it kind of calls or clustered more phosphatidylserine to that site of binding. So this is seen by all of this yellow um, phospholipids that we have here, which is PS. And what this does, cause it's basically changing the arrangement of the lipids in the membrane, it leads to membrane curvature and the budding of this filamentous variant. So we kind of hypothesize that, well, our mutations, if they're affecting how it interacts with the membrane, they're probably, um, we hypothesize that they affect how VP40 interacts with this lipid specifically. So in order to test that, we use another technique called surface plasmon resonance. And surface plasmon resonance is a technique that is used to study the binding relationship between two um, macromolecules. This can be protein-protein interactions, protein-lipid interactions, nucleic acid interactions. Different types of macromolecules can be used in this technique. And the way that it works is you study an immobilized ligand. So you have one of your macromolecules immobilized on a chip, and then you flow over in solution your other macromolecule. In my experiment, I was immobilizing my lipid vesicles that contain my phospholipid that I wanted to test, PS. And in this immobilization, what actually happens is seen here is when you mobilize these liposomes or lipid vesicles, they're able to form this supported bilayer that allow us to replicate the membrane environment. So by doing this, we can kind of understand how this protein is binding to the membrane. And then I flow over in solution my VP40. So and we are able to then monitor the binding of VP40 over time as we flow over in solution, the VP40, and also how VP40 will dissociate from this. Um, surface when we stop flowing it. So it gives us an association rate and a dissociation rate, allowing us to calculate the binding affinity of VP40 to this um, membrane. And also this way will allow us to understand if this mutation are affecting that binding affinity of VP40. And what we found is that these mutations actually do affect the binding affinity of VP40 to PS containing membranes. And I'm only showing you a few of the graphs that we have for the wild type, sorry, wild type G198R and G201 and G198D. But I want to bring your attention more to this table where once we quantify their binding affinity, we're able to see that G198R, and if you remember, this is the one that will increase assembly and increase budding, we also increase the affinity for PS or membrane by twofold. Well, g 1 d will decrease that affinity. And G201R is an interesting one because it has an increase, but the increase is not as comparable to 198R. So with all of this information, now we're able to kind of go back and understand the functional consequences of this mutation. So if you look at our mutation of interest, G198R, for example, now we know that when you have an arginine instead of a glycine at this position, you are able to see um, that VP40 dimer has an increased affinity for PS in the membrane. So you have more binding or tighter binding to the membrane. And what this leads to is then increased localization or increased assembly of the protein at the membrane. And um, in turn, you have increased budding efficiency, meaning that you have more viral particles that are gonna be available to go and infect new cells. This is all great. We're able to characterize G198R, we're able to characterize these different mutations, but how does this help us understand the virus better in a bigger sense outside of just this mutation? One thing that I did not mention earlier is that all of these amino acids carry different charges. So for example, our glycine, which is kind of our wild type, it carries a hydrophobic or an uncharged head group. While our arginine, which is the one that it mutated to in the outbreak, is in the positive head group right here. It carries a positive charge. And our aspartic acid, the D right here, carries a negative charge. And I stated earlier, earlier, earlier that the inner leaflet of the membrane is largely negatively charged. So this takes us back to electrostatics or the law of attraction is how I used to learn it. But we know that like charges, so positive and positive, negative and negative will repel, repel but opposite charges will attract. So now this helps us understand, for example, with G198R is when you move from a G to an R, you're increasing the charge from zero to positive. So you're basically increasing the charge of VP40, hence you're increasing the difference between the membrane and VP40. So that leads to an attraction of the protein to the membrane. But when you have a D, G198D, you're decreasing the charge of this VP40. So basically you're decreasing that attract, uh, you're decreasing the electrostatic difference, making them more alike, leading to a repulsion. And that's why we see a decrease in um, 
plasma membrane assembly, decrease in VLP budding, and we also see a decrease in the binding to PS in the membrane. So when we look, went back and looked at if this is just not happening with this residue and other residues, and indeed you can see that whenever we increase the charge, so we're increasing it from a negative first to a non-charge, and then a negative to a positive, with every increase, there's a corresponding increase in plasma membrane localization or the amount of VP40 that is at the plasma membrane. And what does this mean as we try and understand the virus? So now we can try and understand important interactions. So we know that this interaction with this anionic membrane and the VP40 is very important, that this electrostatic interaction is what drives assembly and budding. We can look at ways of disrupting or probing these interactions. And this is an example of work that was done with a uh, drug, Fendelein. And what Fendelan does is, if you remember that phospholipid PS in the membrane, it actually limits the amount of PS that is in the membrane, so effectively decreasing the negative charge. And we're able to see that when you decrease that negative charge, you also decrease the amount of VP40 that is able to bud out of the cell. So that is how we're able to take these concepts from mutations, cell work, and now trying to understand how we can probe these interfaces to understand the virus and how we can possibly inhibit some of these interactions. Now, this is all at a cellular level, it's not close. So this is more cellular level, we cannot really translate it into therapeutics yet, but this is how we go more in the molecular level and understand how these things work. And um, more into like my journey in graduate school, um, one thing that I found is that the learning in graduate school never stops. I've learned a lot in my research, of course, but also I've learned a lot with the interactions that I've had with people. I've learned a lot when interacting with fellow scientists that can be in conference, in seminars, in our lab meetings. But I've also learned a lot is I, about how instruments work. So I've learned a lot about how the microscope work during my TA work. I've done techniques that I never thought I'd ever do, like TERF, which is like total internal reflective microscope, which is a cool Technique. So what you're seeing here are just those VLPs of our like particles budding out of a cell, which is an amazing, amazing technique. And I've also learned about managing, uh, I've learned when I was managing instruments that we have in the lab. So we have the SPR and the ITC instruments, and I help train people. And I've also learned about how we can use these techniques when people come to me with different experiments and we can try them out. And this just helps further my knowledge. Um, on all of these different techniques and how we can use them to study um, things on the molecular level. Um, so almost in ending, my journey has not been a sum of its part. It's been greater than that. It's been, um, there's a lot of people that have contributed to it and I would like to acknowledge those people. At first, I'd like to acknowledge the Hamburger Lab for being my home away from home home in Michigan State, but also our uh, most importantly, Dr. Bjorn Hamburger first for saying yes to that email in, uh, when I was asking to come into his lab and for to Britta Hamburger uh, for helping teach me a lot of the techniques. When I got into the lab, I was very green about different techniques that can be used and they really helped guide me through science and help teach me on how I can be a better scientist. The Lao Lab at the KBS, and uh, most specifically, Dr. Suzanne McNally, that worked with me throughout that summer. And also the DRS team um, at the NTCP in Swaziland. Doing research in Swaziland is not easy, and having an outsider come in is not easy. So I really appreciate them for allowing me to come and observe and partake in this research. The MasterCard Foundation program at MSU, I would not have been able to attend Michigan State University without this scholarship. And my PI, Dr. Robert Stalin, our advisory committees, collaborators, the Stalin lab, and also my family and friends. I come from a very large family, if you can see right here, a big family that is waiting for me to come back home. And some pieces of advice that I would give to people who are young undergraduate students or high schoolers that are um, thinking of a career in research is, one is it's never too early to start on your research. So I've seen a lot of students that will wait until their third year or their last year to kind of reach, seek out, um, scientific opportunities, I say just your scientific curiosity is enough. You don't have to have it all figured out as you want, what you want to do. You can learn that as you join different labs and you have to actually do the research. Put yourself out there, send those emails to professors, reach out to professors to look uh, for positions. The worst thing that can happen is that someone says no, 
And that just leaves you exactly where you were. There's nothing bad that's going to happen. And the last thing is that there's different types of learning and research, even in undergrad. You can read about research, you can do internship, you can do assistant work, you can do shadowing, but definitely take advantage of these undergraduate research programs that schools have as a way of putting your foot into research. And maybe your journey will be like mine, a little convoluted. We start from plants and then we get to the Ebola virus. But this is how you kind of filter out what you like, what you don't like, and identify your passion and what you really want to study. Fantastic. And what such great tips. I couldn't I couldn't have said it better than how you said it. Um I I don't know that we have too much time for for questions. I I am so enthused to hear the journey as aspect as well as this really awesome, awesome research because it's it, these techniques that you're picking up and that you're building up on are just going to be great ways to continue moving forward and and being able to do that. I also I also see that you are passionate about teaching a little bit and and uh, doing passing on some of your knowledge. Uh, tell us tell us what what is some of the best advice you ever got? I think it was when it comes to teaching is you don't have to know everything. I think one of my biggest fears, especially when training someone on a microscope was them coming to me with a question and I didn't know the answer. And I learned that you don't have to know everything. And that's why you can reach out to all of these different people. Like with the microscope, we have the Nikon reps that can help train us on different techniques that we may not know yet. So that's one thing is just remembering that you have, you have the right to go to someone and be like, I'm not well versed in this, but I can actually go, I'll do some research and read about it in order to um, understand it. And the other one is take it as a learning opportunity. Um, you can learn a lot about these, especially instruments when someone comes and asks you about what you don't do, because your research is very focused on applying, for example, me applying the techniques to VP40. I'd never thought that I would apply imaging to a tablet, for example. So that is why I'm like, I take it as a learning experience as well. And that helps me it just kind of keeps the passion going because every day then I learn something new. Valendile Moza, thank you so much for giving us your time, telling us so much about your journey and giving us these great tips and points of advice. I hope everybody is listening with open ears. Uh, it's been a pleasure hosting you on the Purdue Lecture Hall series today. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.